checking the trees and, and uh, identifying it. Oh, this is something to really be aware if you have your own woodlot, is that the federal government is, is uh, through the uh, NRDC, which administer the, the money and then gives it out to local, uh, uh, local like the Blackfoot Challenge is the last one that administrated our, our grant. So we got a grant, and it's a fuels reduction grant. So the idea is uh, for them to be able to provide money for a landowner to be able to do a 50-50 thing. So it's like, they say it's like, okay, this is a $30,000 job. We'll pay you 15000 to do that. The other half is your responsibility, whether you do it in in-kind efforts on your own part or you hire it done. So basically, the first one we got was a $30,000 grant, and we hired Vandermeer's crew. And then rather than just stay on the 15 acres that uh, was our management unit that we had contracted with the government for, they ranged through the whole entire 40 acres, and they, took, they identified and took out every tree they could find. Uh, the largest one was uh, 36 inches in diameter, and it had thousands, I mean, even the branches had hits on it. And we lost a lot of big trees, but we did take it to the local mill, one of getting 10,000 board feet of lumber out of the deal. So for, for I think that cost us about $3,000. So out of the $15,000, we were able to pay Vandermeer's crew and, and get uh, enough building material to build uh, two 600 square foot timber frame homes. We haven't actually, we, we haven't built them, but we have, we have, you know, we designed the homes, we created the, 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 the structural elements that we wanted in the homes and had them custom milled, these logs custom milled to do those homes. They chain it up and it lifts a log and the tail of it it'll drag, but the majority of the log is off the ground. so it's creating a lot less damage to the forest floor as they're running it. And these guys are very, very conscientious when, when they're working about uh, how much damage that they're going to do and uh, uh, with the intentions of mitigation later, being restoration later. Um, yeah, just more trees. So this is one of three log decks that we had after that. I mean, you can see the blue stains in the ends of the logs. And then this is it. This is, uh, this is the, the lumber we got out of this. So, I mean, this is just some of the lumber we got out of this. And we've been, we've been uh, using the heck out of this stuff. We haven't used any of the big beams because we never got around to using the, uh, to building the homes that we had intended. But we did, uh, we did uh, use a lot of the two-by and one-by material on, on many of our projects. I think, yeah. We had it done by a, a finish mill, which was a, a, a one-man operation in the valley, just a local guy. We had to ship the logs only five miles. So this is another thing you got to do. It's like you have to you have to deal with the uh, the slash. You can't leave it piled up because that brings in another beetle coleus, and they love green slash. They get in there and they burrow in and they they do their thing and then they when they uh, they hatch out they fly and they fly to the tops of the trees, and then they eat out the top of the trees. It's called you know they top kill the trees, and so you have to deal with the slash. So what we did is we bought this little chipper, and. Uh, uh, we bought this used from a guy that was uh, was a victim of the collapsing timber industry, and so he sold it to us. I think we bought it for twenty two hundred dollars or something like that. It was basically a small business loan payment that he had to make, so he he uh, off this little thing. So um, this is actually a pretty good deal. I mean, the, you it'll, you can put a six inch, six inch log in there and it'll chew it up, but uh, mostly it's it works. It, it beats the hell out of it. But uh, mostly we could put the size in that we're, we're putting in there and branches and everything, you know, like tops and everything else. And it, it blows it out in these nice little cubicle chips. Uh, doing rotted logs, laying down a line of rotted logs and then chipping on top of them to replicate um, uh, a, a, a log on the forest floor that had died on the forest floor, which is going to take probably 70 years to actually decompose or more, depending on the size and the moisture. But we did this one. So this was the first year right as we were doing it. And this is three years later, you know, laying it on top of those rotted logs. So it went from, you know, like 16, 18 to two feet tall to down to like just a few inches, six or eight inches tall. And you can see how the forest floor and the grasses are just coming right up through it. And so it's like I watched these things throughout the summer and 
I would dig around in them, and it's like at the hottest point of the summer in, in, in August, you could dig around down to the bottom of it, and there's still moisture in the bottom of it. And you could, you know, it's starting to turn black. You can pull the stuff out. You can see the mycelium working around through it. So, I mean, it's like, uh, especially if you put the, the slash down or the rotten logs and something like that that creates channels for, for water and air to get down into there and, and uh, help the, uh, the mycelium and such as coming up from the forest floor break things down. It, it works a lot faster. I went over and looked at some of the sites over in the, uh, on Lubrec Forest where they, 30 years ago, they have chip piles that are breaking down, but they're still chip piles. You know, and this is three years. Of course, those are big chip piles, but I mean, this is three years and it's almost, I bet in 10 years, that'll just be forest floor. So we did that, start, you know, this is, you can see it's like I just dug in red rot, you know, this was actually laying there and I drug in some other stuff and then chipped right on top of it as we worked our way through the forest. So there's a bunch of, you can see the logs sticking out. So, you know, we have a lot of clay soil, so the, the, uh, the forest uh, soil content is only about four to six inches deep, maybe ten inches at the very most, and then it's clay underneath. So it goes down, hits that clay layer, and starts running down underneath that. So by doing, um, by doing these things on contour, you have a place for the moisture to gather and soak up like a sponge. And so it slows down that march of moisture off the land, or off, you know, down through there. This is a spruce budworm moth. And, you know, the, the next year, Jason and I were down on the walls, you know, slapping ourselves on the back and saying, oh, what good boys we are. And all of a sudden, this worm come repelling down right behind, right between us. And it's like, it's like, oh, shit, what is that? It was this. And it's a spruce budworm. So Mark warned us that they were coming this way. They, they've devastated uh, the Continental Divide area uh, all the way down through Lincoln, and they're moving this direction. And what they do is basically the moth lays the, uh, the eggs on the underside of needles and then the moth hatches out and I think it hatches out in the fall and then it crawls back down the tree and hides underneath the bark. And then uh, in the spring it comes back out, you know, cocoons itself and it comes back out in, a, in, a, in a, see, it's a larva poop pupae stage, and it munches on the uh, new shoots coming off that are just growing up on the, on the fir trees, those really tender, juicy new shoots, and, uh, and eats those away. This is one that's been hit hard, and you can just see where they ate them away. You know, just, and, and they like dug fir a lot, a lot, and that's most of what we have around here is, yeah. There's dug fir and, and ponderosa pine. So we got, we're getting a double whammy between the beetles and the worms. So. It looks to me like a forest uh, fire mosaic. And so I, I think because we've eliminated fire from the, you know, we've, we've, created, we've created the situations to create these, these epidemics, basically, because they're so, the, tree, the forests are stressed. There's way too much going on in the forest, and there's not enough controls on the trees themselves to be able to thin them out naturally and have, have the strongest survive and become big trees and so they're all struggling and so uh, this is this is nature trying to create that balance you know so rather than saying it's like oh you know, it's, it's a it's a plague from hell it's like no it's just nature doing its thing we screwed it up that big tree in the front is the same tree here so this is the what we did we went in there and thinned out these areas you know that one's a little heavily thin but that's on a that's on an access road into the house and for the uh, fire mitigation thing they want to make sure that they could get in and back out again if they get caught. And so you've got to like do 33 feet, a chain on either side of the road. Pretty, you've got to hit it pretty hard. So uh, I went in and took that out. And then these are some of the stands that we were looking at, thinning out how thick those are. You know, this is a dog here of uh, pine. This is what our, what our deer fence is made out of. And our, my yurt that I made out of. You know, it's like this stuff was like right up to our house and we took it out and figured out a way of, of utilizing the material. That's, so that's like, you know, create a yield from your efforts. So we found all kinds of ways to use this stuff. I mean, in, in some areas that we thinned, we just opened it up a little bit. So if heat gets inside, if a fire gets down in there, it does have some way for heat to come out and it doesn't explode. Um, but I mean, they're great. It's like a that's my pole section. You know, it's like this is where I will go to get poles, you know, fence posts and poles for fences and stuff later on. This is that what things look like once we start thinning them out. So you can see there's a lot more space in between them. 
And then I would, I, in this particular case, again, create a year. Most of, most of the small diameter stuff you can't mill. And so people will burn. They'll just bulldoze them into huge piles and burn massive quantities of stuff, putting all that carbon back into the air again. I pull them down into, into uh, piles like this. And then uh, I and EVSD uh, interns and Wolves and Civ interns and woofers and you know whoever I could get to help. And uh, then we, we would uh, pull it, the slash down and then we'd chip that all along these access roads. And I made a point of doing uh, three access roads that were on contour all through this, this particular management unit. So uh, it was a lot easier to, you know, so there wasn't a whole lot of going up and down stuff. So it was a lot easier to try to restore these roads afterwards and try to break up the compaction and, and um, avoid spreading of weeds and such. So all this stuff was really thick. You could not see that distance through there. And, uh, and then uh, now you can see down through it. I opened up the forest floor. There's light getting to the forest floor. There's more water moving across that clay lens underneath the forest floor, feeding more and more plants along the ways of the shrubs, the, the forbs, the grasses. Uh, you can see how thick it was from those stobs there. That was when in January I was thinning. I was like reaching through the snow. And so the stobs are pretty high on that one. Uh, and then the next spring, so we had a bloom of, of balsam roots that I had never seen anything like it before. It looked like a slurry drop of yellow paint. And then right under, just as soon as those guys started to fade, then the lupins came in. Of course, this was a wet spring too, but we've had some wet springs lately. And so we just had amazing blooms of wildflowers the next couple of years. From the last two years, three years, four years of doing forestry work on this land that I did, I've worked in the forest. I worked, I planted trees for 10 years. And, or uh, six years, and I've worked doing ranches and things like that. This piece of property, looking at it from permaculture eyes, taught me more about forest stewardship and ecology and how a forest works and responds to our efforts than anything I've ever seen before, I've ever, that I've ever experienced before. You know, it was, it was a tremendous education. And just to throw this in from a biodynamic uh, point of view. Uh, we have a, a friend that's a, a Salish elder and she kind of befriended us and I talked to her about this and, and I was taught a pipe ceremony a long time ago so I do pipe cer ceremonies on a regular basis. And she says take your pipe and she gave me a set of ceremonies to go through and it's like go to the four corners of the land and go to the center of the land and ask for guidance and permission to do the work that you're doing and the forest will tell you what to do. And it's like so everything I've done has the, the forest has just responded beautifully. You, know, you could just see the trees have, have uh, bloomed out, spread out. They, they don't look as stressed. They're starting to go like this instead of like this. The uh, elder, or the elder, not the elderberry, the uh, service berries were these little things that were reaching up like this, trying to get a few little um, bits of leaf up into the light. They're now going like this, really productive. It was just white flowers everywhere for the forest this year. Uh, last two years and berries really thick and then what we've really seen from this you know that and, and, the, and the, the, the buffalo berry and the you know just the forest floors just ex responded but what we've seen is a tremendous increase in birds one, one morning uh, last spring we were sitting uh, at our kitchen table and, and you know all our gardens right out front and we were we counted nine species of flocks birds in flocks. Nine species all through the ponderosa pines, all through the, the, the lower dug firs that we could see, and all through our garden. It was just swarming with all kinds of different species of birds. And I think that is probably, uh, probably the thing that's keeping the spruce budworm and the vine beetles un un check to a great degree is the fact that it, it opened it up, made it more possible for the birds, the, the, the budworm especially, because they, to spread from tree to tree, they have to repel down and can't let the wind blow them to the next branch. And if the, those trees are spread out, they're hanging there vulnerable as hell to the birds. You know, and so the birds are just feasting on them. So really, a really good lesson for me and a, a great opportunity for me to share this with other people that, you know, really good stewardship. I mean, I was a tree hugger going, oh, the forest, we just leave the forest alone. You know, it's like nature will take care of itself. Well, no, we screwed that up. Yeah, and we're responsible for trying to get it back under control again and then get it to the point where it can take care of itself the way it's supposed to.